from the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. I'm Emily Crosby and this is December 1st, 2015 and I'm here with Mr. Vernon Damer Jr. at uh, the University of Southern Mississippi at the program on oral history and cultural heritage and with me is uh, John, or with us is John Bishop and Guha Shankar and we're doing this interview as part of the Civil Rights History Project co-sponsored by the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. So thank you so much for joining us and doing the interview. You're welcome. Um, Mr. Damer, could you tell us uh, when and where you were born and about your family history? Mm, yes. Um, I was born in the Kelly Settlement community about five miles north of Hattiesburg here where we are today in uh, August 27, 1929. Tell me about your family. Okay. Um, my dad, Vernon F. Damer Sr., uh, was one of 12 children born to George Damer and Ellie Kelly Damer. He was the youngest of 12 kids, six boys and six girls. Uh, one of the boys died as an infant, so that left a family really of five boys and six girls. Being the way segregation was back in that day, discrimination and the oppressive situation for blacks in Mississippi and where the black race had very little defense from law enforcement. My grandfather made a conscious effort to make sure that his six female daughters had the opportunity to leave the state of Mississippi at a very young age. This was for their own protection because it was pretty obvious at that time that uh, the white male, he treated the black male the same way how he wanted to, my grandfather, he saw this, being raised, born and raised in Mississippi. And likewise, the, the male sons, all except my father, who was the youngest boy, they left the state also and went north. So your father's the only one? My father was the only one to remain here. And since he was a baby boy, I would imagine he was the closest to the parent, you know, being the baby. Mm -hmm. And he worked on the farm. And uh, he made a decision to remain and not leave the state. The older males went ahead and assimilated into the uh, society in Chicago and those places where they were identified as Caucasians, which is fine, because you were going looking for a better life, and I don't fault them at all about that. It's a situation where if you don't ask, you don't tell. So he was not asked because all, because all of them are very, very light complexed and just right off back to look like whites. Mm. So the assimilation was not, and they were not that difficult, and they were very fortunate in landing good employment. The females, uh, all of them went north and they married African American men and black men. It's interesting that the... Yes, it was. Uh huh. Do you have a, a, a speculation about why the women did one thing and the men did something different? No, I don't. Yeah. Probably realizing, you know, and raising, being raised in the South, it was probably fine, uh, easier mm -hmm. uh, to find a suitable black man to marry. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. uh, not being closely affiliated with the white males in Mississippi, they felt comfortable, mm -hmm. you know, being in the black environment. Mm -hmm. I would just imagine that was a reason, reason why. And the same applied to me when I um, went in the military in 1951, being raised in all black community. Uh, I never really had no desire to pass for any other race than being African American. I was married to a dark skinned African American woman and mm -hmm. I was very comfortable. Mm -hmm. did, um, did the men who assimilated, did they stay in touch with the family? Yes. Yes, they did. They'd come and visit. Mm -hmm. And on occasion, um, they would, one or maybe two of them would bring their wives, their white wife, with them. And that was not hard to do at that time because due to the complexion of the family and there were other mixed races in the community, uh, I'll tell you the truth, there was quite a few of us coming out of slavery. Mm -hmm. So anytime uh, a white person saw so a light-skinned person with a dark-skinned person, it was automatically assumed that they were all Negroes mm -hmm. because you had a lot of mulattoes around. Mm -hmm. And that came out of slavery, you know, as a result of the mixing of the races by the slave master and his family, you know. Um, uh, so, so that when they come here, it's almost like the whites are passing. Yeah, and they they felt comfortable, you know. Yeah. Good. And moving around, I never saw any anxiety. But being a little boy, you know, I didn't pay any attention right. anyway. Yeah, they were just people visiting. Yeah. Right. Uh huh. Um, my sense is, or I've been told by some people, that Kelly Settlement and some of the other areas, you know, as you were saying, a lot of mixed race people, that um, that there was a, a sense, at least among some people, of being kind of in between, that they um, didn't really identify. You've been saying you identify with the black community, but mm -hmm. I've heard some people say that they didn't identify one or another, that they sort of had an independence. Are, we, are you aware of that? It could have happened. <clears throat> Pardon me. It could it could have happened, but coming out of the family where I never saw any racial separation or division, my grandparents and my parents always treated everybody the same. Mm. My school was all black. My church was all black. Consequently, I didn't have any any notions about going over to the to the other race mm -hmm. or being maybe out of place. I felt very comfortable being black mm -hmm. and, and likewise today. Yeah. And went through the military feeling that way. Yeah. Black and from Mississippi. Oh, no, you're not. Oh, yes, I am. <laughs> you know? In other words, I'm not making this up. This is the way it was. You know? You're not going to change who I am, right? Oh, no, 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 no. And I saw that coming out of my family. Yeah. My grandfather, George Damon, which you probably already heard of this, he was white. Mm -hmm. You know, he was thoroughbred white. His mother was white, and uh, and his dad was a German, Peter mm -hmm. Damer, mm -hmm. from Darmstadt, Germany. I spent a lot of time in the military, and he was white. And um, my grandfather's mother uh, was born out of wedlock, mm -hmm. Laura Barnes, and she was placed with a mulatto woman uh, to raise, and while being there with the mulatto lady, who was a Barnes, because you know they carried the slave name and mm -hmm. all, this mulatto lady was running a boarding house up in Covington County, not about 25 miles from here. And that's that's where uh, my dad's, my grandfather's mother, lived and worked. And then Pitt and the Dama family. So he was raised in that. Sure, the Dama family migrated from Germany mm -hmm. because of economic conditions over there. It was like five of those brothers. And one of the older brothers settled there in the area and he became acquainted with my grandfather's mother and uh, they had a child. Yeah. And then later on, my grandfather, George Damer, grew up in, you know, in, that, in that environment. And his mother, Laura, she hired this black guy, Charlie Kraft, to work for her in a business. And I think she ran a, a boarding house for the woodcutters and all also eventually. 
And then she married an ex-slave, Charlie Craft. Yeah. They went on to have nine mixed-race kids. My grandfather, George Damer, he was the oldest son. Okay. Yeah, he was the oldest son in that mixed-race family. Now, when they got married, even though what? Laura, my grandfather's mother, was assumed to be mulatto because she had been raised up in a mulatto family, uh, that was okay as long as she was unmarried. But when she married Charlie Craft, started having kids, then the old, old white Nettie ever said, hey, yeah, uh -uh, this, we don't, we don't go. Right, it's okay for them to be together, but not to, for them to be married. Well, right, and to have kids. Uh -huh. And they started that, okay? Kids and, that he... And then they had to leave from there and move down in the community where we live. And why was it okay for them to be in Kelly settlement? Because there were a lot of mulattoes there, the Kelly family, which my grandmother came out of. Okay. My dad's mother, Ellen Kelly Damer. And by the way, her, her mother was also white. Uh, she was uh, born out of Red Lock, uh, Whitlock, and she was put with a black family, Macomb family, to be raised. And that's how she met up with my grandmother, Ellen Kelly's dad, Warren Kelly, okay? Because there were two, there were two, a mulatto and a white. That's interesting. So that's where you got this real light complexion. Right. Uh, but there were other families out in our community, likewise. Just the Wilson family, Eaton family. At one time, our family was identified, you know, you, as kind of a slang. That's where all the white Negroes live. Well, we uh, talked to uh, Mrs. Smith earlier today, and she said she was called that, a uh, white Negro. Mrs. Smith, which um, one? Uh, Jeanette. Oh, Jeanette, I know, yeah, yeah. Jeanette, sure. Yeah, she said she had that same name. Right. Yeah, of course, she was from up around So So, Mississippi. Yeah, that's what she was. Yeah, she was a Musgrove, I know. Telling, her. yeah. Mm -hmm. A lot of mixed race kids. It's a, I, you know, the part of Mississippi I'm from, there were a few uh, individuals, but not the families like this it, that I was aware of uh -huh. growing up in the community. Right. Hattiesburg seems like <clears throat> this area. Um, do you, is that true? Did Hattiesburg have more mixed race families? Well, I have nothing to compare it compare it with, um, but we had a lot of them. Yeah, a lot of them. Sure. Can you tell me what it was like growing up uh, uh, on your, well, you had a farm, your, your, mm -hmm. your family farm. Can you right. tell us about that? Yes. Um, my dad being the youngest son and actually involved in farming, that was his first occupation, you know, being there with him. My grandfather, George, they owned several hundred acres of land, and he was a very, very successful farmer. And having to raise 12 kids, you know, on his farm. You had to be good to feed them mm -hmm. because there were no public service <laughs> jobs out. And their families really lived on mostly what they raised on the farm. <coughs> Pardon me. Consequently, my dad saw this as just a normal way of life. And he liked it, and he became a landowner after he married my mother. Uh, and my mother's from the same community. And uh, m my grandfather gave him a little land and a start, and then he went on and acquired his own land, but there was adjoining properties. And um, my dad became successful in the business. And early, I would say in the mid-1930s, uh, and my dad was born in 1908. By that time, he was like 26, 27 years old. He uh, bought a school bus because the days of segregated schools, um, the black kids had to have transportation, so the white school system loosened up, you know, and allowed uh, independent um, individuals to go buy a bus to transport black kids to and from school. So what that did, my dad bought the school bus, and that put him earning more income to supplement the family. So if he bought it, they would pay him to drive it? They, and he leased his services in the bus to the county, yeah. and they would pay him to drive. And in the meantime, when he get the... Uh, um, so he both simultaneously earned something and get his kids to school. Yeah, right. And not only that, by buying the bus, he had the opportunity to provide public service mm. to other people in the community, organizations or whatever, because during that time, we were coming out of the depression, there was very little personal transportation around. 
Mm -hmm. So he hauled people to Sunday school conventions, church conventions, or what, basketball games, which supplemented his income. And uh, he continued to do that until 1940. And I remember these dates because that time, you know, I'm born 20. I was like 11 years old, oldest kid. Right. Uh, you know, of eight kids. So and you had a lot of responsibility, I Yes, I, I grew up with responsibility. And my dad and all the farmers in the area, this whole area, they were using animals to farm. Mechanization had not yet arrived, you know, yeah. in this area. Not to any extent to where it was noticeable in a family farm. Mm -hmm. Consequently, my dad... Uh, in 1940, the war was starting in Europe, right. as you well know. And Camp Shelby is just south of here, about 15 miles, and it was one of the major tra uh, training camps. And it, it started to grow to provide what? Soldiers go off and fight the war in different locations. That created jobs because the camp had to grow to do this. That means black folks that were living on the farm had a chance to leave the farm, not leave the farm, go and work to supplement their farm income, okay? So what Dad did then, he saw an opportunity with that extra money to go and buy him a new tractor. So he used the income from working Camp Shelby or what No, was he used he used he used the income from uh he used the improvement in the economy. Got it. Okay? Mm-hmm. Other you know. Right. To, to, to uh to bring more money into the community, you know, and he had more activity with what he had already going on. Mm -hmm. And he was using his bus to transport people to and from Camp Shelby mm -hmm. to work and all. So what he decided, took that extra money and bought him uh, a tractor and all of the implements that goes along to do his, run his farming operation. He would have been really in the forefront of that. He was in the forefront. Hey, he was the only guy in the neighborhood. White or black had a tractor as far as we know. Definitely with black folks. And when he bought the tractor, well, the other farmers in the area were using mules and horses. And by my dad having a tractor, he could cultivate more land. And he expanded his farm because we used the tractor to, what, to assist the other farmers in work that they needed, you know, to move them forward. And in around 1942, when the war was really moving along, uh, and the black community had money coming in, my dad said, hey, now it's time to open a grocery store. <laughs> so he opened a grocery store adjacent to the house. and He was really a very savvy business person. He, he was a mover and a shaker. Yeah. Only had a 10th grade education, but he'd take chances that I've, I would have bought that. <laughs> but, but being raised the way he was yeah. in a progressive home, my grandfather was not openly that uh, progressive, but... He was a mover and a shaker by him having the land that he had and the success that he had. Mm -hmm. And not only that, he, my grandfather and my dad were very close friends too, okay? They worked in partnership. But by that time, my grandfather's getting up in age and the farming now is moving toward my dad and his family, us boys. So he's taking more responsibility. Right, he's taking on more responsibility. Consequently, dad built a grocery store, a country grocery store. And in that country grocery store, then, in, in the black neighborhood, he also attracted some white customers. And the grocery store was fully equipped, you know, with everything going in, cans, good, and very little electricity in that area at that time. A lot of people in living in the country had ice boxes, and they used block ice, you know, for mm -hmm. special treats. Yeah. So he built a little ice house <laughs> right next to the grocery store. Where would he get the ice? We bought it down Hattiesburg okay. from the wholesaler that sold it to restaurants and all. And one of my jobs was to take that school bus and, and go down and haul in 300-pound blocks of ice and, and deliver them on a Friday, bring them, put them in the ice house, and chip them into 50 and 25-pound blocks. <laughs> so, so I could, that, that was one of my jobs, okay? Yeah. And being in the summertime, I didn't mind it too much. Um, but he, the, the ice house was built homemade with sawdust in the side as insulation, sawdust in the bottom. I mean, it was quite cool. How did he know how to do that? He just... Smart guy. Yeah. That's all I can say. Yeah. yeah so, did, so did you all, did you help build? No, well, no, at that time, I was only about 14, 15 years old going to school. You know, my interest was, hey, I'm doing what I'm being told to do, okay? Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm doing what I'm being told to do, too, without any question, okay? 
<laughs> you and, weren't a rebellious. And not only that, by being out in the forefront, and I was kind of comparing, you know, boys, you know, I'm doing this, I can drive a tractor, you can't. Right. And you got you, that You mind. behind the mule. <laughs> you behind the mule, so, you know, I felt real good about who I was. And, yeah. But we never did feel like, you know, there was never that atmosphere, you're better than somebody else, okay? It, that just never crept into the picture because I saw my family just maintaining like they always were. Did your family talk to you all about that, or was it just no, no, how no. they acted? No, no, it's how they acted. Yeah. You know, go to Black Sun, go to Black Sunday School, everything you do is black. Right. Segregation kept us what? Yeah. It kept us together. Mm -hmm. In a way, integration really affected our unity. Mm -hmm. and you didn't no have a choice about before that. about being... Well, we depending on one another. And having the same... People couldn't escape it. No, you couldn't escape it. No, if you stepped outside of your boundary, you're in deep trouble. Yeah. Right. And, and what you did, you, you learned... You didn't learn. You, you were just comfortable in an environment because you do nothing else. Yeah. So you were growing up, so you were working on the farm? I worked on the farm. I started off working on the farm as soon as I was big enough, and, and then feeding the, the hogs and chickens. Went into the grocery business. I learned how to cut meat. We butchered our own cattle in most cases. And then, we, and then uh, uh, around 1945, now my dad had a grocery business going on. We had a school bus business and we had to farm. And my dad is having all these boys in a row, see. And that's good labor uh, at hey, that well, point. Well, had in-house labor. Okay. <laughs> what kind of salary were you getting? <laughs> uh, hey, room sleep, and board. Room and board. That's what the waiter I was looking for. That's right. <laughs> right. Room and board, and a little spending money on a weekend, which was not very much either. Did you get? Did he have candy? Did you get spending penny candy at the store? Oh, 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 yeah. 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 You, you, you could do that, but you know, you, you had to watch it. Yeah. Yeah. We were very disciplined. Yeah. But you still steal a little bit every now and then. You know yeah. how that goes. Boys gonna be boys. Yeah. And in 19, around 1945, when the war effort was really moving, you know, in Europe and in in the Pacific area, um, there was more money coming into the Hattiesburg, more pe black folks being employed uh, to supplement their income. So my dad went off and bought a sawmill, a small sawmill because we had a lot of land, had a lot of timber on, and all, and first he started cutting his own timber, and he had a little, had two guys that he worked with had experience. And then there we were, and so we started in what? Cutting logs and cutting lumber um, for sale in the neighborhood, and then other folks heard about it. First thing I know, the lumber business is starting to flourish, and Dad was selling his lumber to local farmers or whoever to build barns and chicken houses and outhouses. So we had three areas of income going on, okay? When we spoke um, uh, with your mother, well, Mrs. Damer, right. she told me that um, your father knew which trees the, the uh, boards came from in the house that was burned down. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. When was that house built? When? I was away in the military. And it had to be built probably in the early 60s or late 50s. I don't remember. So did you grow up in the um, in that same spot where the house oh, oh, is yes. now? Oh, yes, I grew up there. So it was, a new, it, it was, was a, a new house. Firebombing had destroyed, which was a new house that they were living in when the firebombing took place. So, the, so they had already had one destroyed? It, well, no. Oh, the so house I grew up in was the old original that's home. That's what I was wondering about. And then they built a new home after my dad married the, my stepmother, Ella. Okay. But she's been in the family. She's our mother. Yeah. She's been in the family 60-something years. Okay. She's been your mother 60 years? Oh, oh, yeah. And she's a real fine lady, you know, and everything worked out fine. My dad and mom, they married 1928, and they divorced about 1935. My dad had the three boys by her. So we got three sets of kids. Three by my mother, three by another, the second wife. She died at 31 years old, some kind of muscular disease. Mm. And then he married uh, the ex existing mother uh, in 1952. I've been married then for a year. I, my kids are the same age, or older than. Then, then, uh, yeah. then your youngest. Sure. Yeah. So um, let me just ask you one more. So in so uh, in 1935. Uh huh. So I'm trying to. So you were about uh, I was six, six years, years old. old. So yeah. 
So, you, so, so did you have a relationship with your mother after they divorced? Yeah, for about two or two and a half years because her family only lived about three miles from where we lived, all in the same community. And my mother took the baby boy with her to live with the grandparents. And my dad kept the two older kids, my brother and I, because we, uh, uh, he didn't have enough money to pay child support. Mm -hmm. And the jury, he told me the jury, said, you keep him and feed him. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, <laughs> and he didn't talk about that because my mom, my mother, my maternal mother and my dad had a beautiful relationship. Yeah. Um, I never heard either one of them talk bad about the other even after they divorced. Yeah. Which I, I definitely appreciated when I grew up. You know? Yeah. That's, that makes sense. It's not always the case. Right. So my mom took the baby and my dad then um, took us and he didn't dump us on our grandparents who lived nearby. I wondered. Cause no, he did not. He, he kept us right there in the house with him and then we visited the grandparents, you know, as needed. And he had other older ladies in the family because people, jobs were scarce, mm -hmm. you know. Depression, 1928, 20, we were still in depression. Yeah. They'd come and cook and clean, and my dad would pay them or whatever. And they were older ladies, family, and it worked out well until he married again in 1938. And he married there, and then he went on to have three sons by that wife. And she died in 1949. She had three boys. So there we are again in the house with my dad with five boys and no mom. <laughs> and yeah. Right. And so but I grew up with that wife. Mm -hmm. Okay. So she so, was in many ways your mother. Right. In many the, ways. The one but person. you know having one baby right after another cuz she was a younger woman. She's pretty busy. She's busy. Yeah, yeah. but that's okay. We yeah. had a we had a lady in the house. Yeah. And it worked out fine. You're happy to have a, a lady in the right. house. But then again, we us boys, five boys, ended up then with older ladies coming in, cooking and cleaning. So we were raised a lot without a mother. Mm -hmm. And our dad met the need for both. Even though he was a busy man, we were always a part of his life. Um, part of his life in working, part of his life in social activities, part of his life in play. Um, he didn't ever had to take out time for us. It was just a, everything you did. Everything flowed together. You know, yeah. we'd work all day and go to the river, our property around adjacent to the river, and go and swimming. Yeah. He beat us in the water. You know? <laughs> you know, he was just that kind of guy. And I'm not making this up. You know. Yeah. And all, if you don't talk to any of my brothers, our dad was a focal point of our life. Yeah. That doesn't mean that we didn't appreciate the grandparents or the other the, uh, the ladies that came through the family. But he, he was, he, he was, he was your with parent. Us. We didn't miss any fairs, any circuses, and things like that. That must have been a really remarkable childhood. To it was the combination of the yes. work and then also it the was. opportunities. Yes, why? And then what that did by having, on this my own person, my by having focused mostly on one family person, like your father who was very involved in our life, um, it created an unusual unity in cooperating amongst us. My dad was a leader. He was a boss, but he wasn't bossy, but he was a disciplinarian. Consequently, we all, you know, danced by the same music, which is what I mean by that. We all followed the same group of orders and there were no any confusion being what mom said, what dad said. Everything coming from done one direction. And I learned this over time in raising my own kids. Mm -hmm. Consequently, us bo we bonded. Mm -hmm. Us boys, hey, I mean, the bond even exists today. You and I've lost three close. brothers, you know, but hey, yeah. if you mess with one, you mess with the whole crowd. But we always got along real well. We didn't, we didn't fight. Uh, we are, yeah. we competed, but we got along real well. And to some extent, our wives didn't quite understand that. <laughs> They couldn't compete with your brothers? <laughs> that, that's a fact. <laughs> but it worked out good, you know? Yeah. So, what was your schooling like? Uh, going to a country school, 
And the school was like only with half a mile from the house. We walked to school. Did your family provide the property for the school? Yes, my great grandfather Warren Kelly provided the property. But he gave the uh, the school. He gave one two acres, by the way, uh, to build a school building on. Mm -hmm. And that was my grandmother Ellen Kelly's father, Warren Kelly. Okay, and he was a descendant of um, Green Kelly, slave master, and his African mistress, Sarah. And, you know, he was a mixed-race kid. And that put him in line, you know, with family connections. And he came out of that, uh, out of that environment, you know, owning quite a bit of property. And what he did, he used his property to build his first church on mm. and the first school and just kind of structured the community around it. Now, you had other families that came and started to build with that same attitude. Mm -hmm. So this was not a one-man show. Mm -hmm. But he provided the, the land and, and worked with the school system. And the first school was opened in 1879. You know, yeah, school. But prior to then, they had school in the church. But that's the first which school was building. Built, yeah, first school building. Yes, ma'am. Now, the first school itself came out of the church, which was built, was a one a log cabin. What um, what denomination was it? A Shady Grove, or a Baptist church. Okay. Uh huh. Was it built after the Civil War? Do you no, know? No, no. It was built in. Well, the church itself was established in 1864. Okay. That the makes sense. the the uh, black and the Negroes in that the uh, blacks in that state during prior to that time was going to a white church. You probably mm -hmm. heard that, have you? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know about this particular community, but I know it was common. Well, it did in our community. The whites, you know, uh, naturally they were subjects, you know, of the plantation owners, mm -hmm. and they went to the the local Baptist church, which is about four or five miles from where our church is. And they attended church there. And it's a Providence Baptist Church. And it's still in existence also in this world. So is it a white church now? And it's a white church, yeah. Sure, a large church. And then uh, um, the, the black church members established that church, the Shady Grove Baptist Church. And the Shady Grove came from the first church service they had was on the ground. On a shady tree, mm. okay? Yeah. And the church we have there is right in the same place. The trees are gone, but the church is here. That's too bad about the trees. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And it was a one-room log cabin. Yeah. And that one-room log cabin also served as the first school. Where did the teachers come from? Local. Yeah. Uh-huh. And so when you were going... When I say local, it came out of the family. Yeah. The, yeah. And yeah. That, from the beginning, from the from the from when it was first founded... Mm -hmm. The, the first teachers were family members from back in the 1870s. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Where did they get their education in slavery? Or did they get it in the immediate aftermath? That's a good question. You, that's not part of the family history? Uh, it, was, it was obvious that education in religion was the avenue out of slavery. Because if the first thing you're going to do is build a church, mm -hmm. then the second thing you're going to do as a freed slave is to build a school. You learn something from being what? Enslaved. Mm -hmm. Because you saw that going on around you. So rather than go out, you know, do something differently, what you do is you repeat what you've already seen. Yeah. Even though you may not have been a part of the building, you were part of what? Of the success. Yeah, you to, know what freedom. Right. And my grandfather, my great-grandfather Warren Kelly, he educated his kids. Yeah. And uh, when my grandfather, George Damer, wanted to marry Ellen, no, oh, where's your education? And he would not, he would not permit it until what? until my grandfather went to Jackson State and improved in his education because that's where my grandmother Ellen Kelly had gone. Okay. So there was enough education at that time coming right out of slavery, okay, 
well, let, let's put it was enough forethought about education yeah. that provided uh, people who had enough to teach. Well, there were always people that found ways to learn. Found ways to learn, right, right. Even when there was a law saying you couldn't. Right. So your grandfather, George Damer, went to Jackson State for a while? Yes, he did. Okay. And your father went through 10th grade? He went through 10th grade in a local community school, Bay Spring School. That was probably the last grade they had. That, at that time, it was the last grade, and as the population increased and decreased, it would go from 10 to 12, back to 10 to 12. And at the time, my dad was going to his 10th grade. By the time I graduated in 1948, it was 12th grade. So what was, um, so you said that you went to the school about a half mile from your home. Yes. And what was that school like? Uh, being in a community where you knew a lot of the kids, practically all of the kids, except the ones that maybe in outlying areas, it was, it was more like a big family reunion. You knew everybody and it was a lot of fun. Uh, and you never felt out of place. Uh, and the teachers that we had um, blended right into that, that same environment. And, and it, was, it, was, uh, it was a good atmosphere for learning mm -hmm. because the education I have today, the basic education, what it is and what you see and what you hear started right there. Mm -hmm. And coming out of a family, like many other black families too, by the way, you know, they came uh, prepared to learn. And my dad always had a saying, a lot of the other, the older guys that had been, I heard the kids say that, says, hey, I'm not sending you to school to carry a lunch. <laughs> <laughs> okay, because we didn't have a lunch room. Hey, so I got work here at the house for you to do. So going to school, Serve two purposes, get an education, plus get out a lot of hard work. Okay, so there, it didn't lack a lot of motivation there. It didn't take a lot of motivating to do it, okay? Yeah. And a whole lot of the kids, their families were not able to continue their education. Right. We had a lot of dropouts. Yeah. And that was, the, as I look back, that was a sad thing. Where my family and there was other families, you know, allowed their kids to go on through and graduate. All of us graduated from high school. Yeah, no, I know that. I've had many people tell me that they had to work so they couldn't keep going to school. The, and I saw that with God. You got to the fourth grade. Mm -hmm. By the time you made it to the fifth, the kid's big enough to go to the fields and work, you start losing population. Mm -hmm. And by the time you got to the 10th, 11th grade, my class only had eight people in it. Yeah. And we started off with a big class, you know, in the primary. Yeah. What were your favorite subjects? Oh... Uh, I like math. Mm -hmm. uh, I like reading. And math and reading, mm -hmm. English I had difficulty with because I could never grasp the verb and the noun and the pronoun. I could do those, but when you got over to the other parts. The subjunctive? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, Whatever and that I, is. And I, I kind of tuned it out because I figured I didn't need it anyway. And I found out later that I did. And so I had to go back and do some remedial study, you, you know, to move ahead. You didn't see any need for right. it. But those are my favorite and favorite subjects. And then later on, when I say later on, when I got to be in about the fifth or sixth grade, we had a spelling class where mm. the kids get up before the class and the teacher would call your word and you spell it. I fell in love with spelling. And the way it happened was my dad drove a school bus, and when he come to pick up the kids, the spelling was the last class at the end of the day, and he would come to my classroom. And here I am up at the board writing my spelling letters that the teacher would call them out, and my dad's sitting there watching me misspell these words. <laughs> okay? So when we get, get home at night, he says, get that spelling book. <laughs> and we sit down in front of the fireplace, kerosene lamp, and he called me those words. And if I missed one, he bumped me upside the head. And after a while, you know, I got where I learned. And then <laughs> I, I learned how to, what, identify syllables? Mm -hmm. And then I do pretty well at that. And so mm -hmm. that turned out to be, helped a lot. Was it, uh, did you enjoy doing that with your dad? Or was it pressure? No, I didn't enjoy it. was it. pressure. <laughs> no, no, I didn't enjoy getting bumped upside the head, you know. <laughs> Little, <laughs> you, you have to learn how to act under pressure if you're going right, to get. Right, <laughs> that's exactly right. So. But all in all, the school turned out well. Mm -hmm. 
Um, graduated, you know, on time, 18 years old. Uh, I've talked to a few people. I think they're uh, a little younger than you, and they went to different schools. But um, one person was telling me that she had a, she didn't call it civics class. I can't remember what she called it, but she said that the teacher actually talked to them about voting in their class. Did you ever have any kind of? Yes, yes. I don't want to miss that piece. Uh, our principal was uh, progressive. Uh, he was educated. Uh, he saw he saw he saw the need for education, and I lost my thought. Um, I'd asked you about voting uh, teachers in. Oh yeah, yeah. He saw the need for the education, and he was really in tune with African American history, Negro history. I learned about Booker T. Washington, you know, early in the stage. George Washington Carver, uh, the Underground Railroad, and all of those things I learned right there in the, in the 1940s. We had a little thin green back black history book, and I went looking for one when I returned home, and it identified the prominent Negroes back in that day, then that it really made a difference in bringing us forward as far as education is concerned. And I tried to find it, and he he acquired that book, and I, and we had to. It was a part of the curriculum at seventh and eighth grade. Mm. So I had a real good feel of, uh, of what blacks had done up to that period. You know, who invented the cotton gin, and, and things that came along in that era. Okay. Did you have any sense of the politics behind that? No. Because of course. No. The white school district, you know, the what, you know, I imagine that your school had a uh, black principal and then uh, probably a white superintendent. White or superintendent. Something. And the most of our textbooks came from the white schools because they passed their used textbooks down to the black schools. Mm -hmm. Right. Some would have pages missing. You see names of other kids in them, but they were, they were books. Did you think about that at the time no. that you're getting these secondhand mm -hmm. books or no. anything? No, I didn't. Did you have any sense of the white kids' school, or did you have any contact with white kids? The, the white school was only about two and a half, three miles away, and they lived in another world. Yeah. But now their property that joined ours, we would see them. We knew them, but we went to separate schools. Everything was separate. Mm -hmm. Separate churches, schools, you know, separate theaters when you went to town and have a chance to go to the movie. You know, we, we didn't have any social interaction other maybe uh, we didn't up in a creek swimming, you know, on a hot summer day and played just like and nothing ever happened. Yeah, I grew up with them, yeah. but we didn't, socially we didn't, yeah. we didn't mix outside of that, no. I know you said that your dad's store had white customers. Had white customers. Did he sure ever did. have uh, white people working on the land? Yes. Mm -hmm. There were some poors in the community that were just so poor that they would come and they'd work in the cotton fields. Yeah. Pick cotton. And uh, I do remember they wouldn't be in, in mixed up, say like maybe a part of the field, but not the distance away, a little segment here, blacks and a little segment there, all adjoining, picking cotton together. Yeah. Right. It's a, it's a, it's but just, now they were extremely poor white folks to do that. And that they really, that they would have to have a pretty desperate need in order very to, desperate to work for need. a black Very family. desperate need, yes. Yeah. But we didn't look at them as being poor, just some white folks, you know, come pick cotton. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, when you were working in the store, when your dad had the store, were there ever any issues with white customers, or did things go pretty my smoothly? Dad had, my dad had, had uh, not malicious, you know, not uh, arguing and that. The white customers would come and take his goods and wouldn't pay him because my dad could not make them pay, okay? Back in that day, people didn't walk around with credit cards or cash money in the pocket. They'd buy groceries and put them on a charge book. And when they got paid, they come pay the bill and buy more stuff. And they're living from week to week or payday to payday. Well, some of the white customers took advantage of my dad like that. And I know this one guy, uh, right after the war, came back and he was a vet. And he got in good with my dad. He was paying his bill real well. My dad let him get too far out. And he owed my dad several hundred dollars and walked off. And I and by that time I'm working in the grocery store, you know, I'm a clerk cutting meat, selling ice, 
you know, pumping gas, fixing flats, whatever. And I was in tune with what was going on in the business. And my dad had a good business on them, Sarah, that when country folks come by, you know, to buy, oh, he, money was ever not ever had a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And actually, you had to put it back into the business. But the business was good and growing, and you had them to do that. What well, would, uh, would your dad say anything about that? Did he talk to you? or did No, he, he didn't say that. I, he, he just, yeah, we, had, we'd had, we had no distractions like television. Yeah. There was a lot of calm family conversation that went on in the presence of the kid. Mm -hmm. And I, my dad was open. Mm -hmm. And he said, yeah. And said, I let Sam have this number one. And he won't pay me. Mm -hmm. And, I, and he, he'd be disappointed. And then he'd move on. Yeah. Okay. And on the uh, and on uh, on, uh, on the other hand, I saw my dad, and I was a part of this. Um, there was some families there, primarily black. Not very many. It was so poor they'd come to buy groceries, didn't have enough, and they have kids. And when they were driving to the store, they sit on. You saw this picture of the store. Sit on the porch. My dad would give them a drink and a moon pie. And that was their treat. Mm -hmm. Walked up there, you know, from way back in the woods someplace. And then when they, before they got ready to leave, they'd have a little grocery list. Most of them had the grandmother or somebody like that. He'd give them extra meat, mm -hmm. just pass out stuff. And he just had an open heart. Mm -hmm. yeah, And he got that from his dad. Excuse me. Oh, I imagine that's something you never, you never lose. No. Uh -uh. Mm -hmm. He got that from, from George Damer. My grandfather, George Damer, had enough property to where he had sharecroppers. You probably heard that. Mm hmm and only a couple of families, but they weren't, they were not servants. Mm -hmm. They people coming in looking well to make a living. They come from other communities. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had a couple of rental houses, you know, nothing, nobody had nothing fancy. And they'd move in and what we made in, you know, mm -hmm. uh, as far as edibles, mm -hmm. greens, peas, you even had sugar cane, made on cert and all that. They were like a family. They participated in it. Mm. Nobody went hungry. It was a more communal kind of. It was it, it, right, but you maintain your independence and you were respected as an individual, and there was a love relationship in that environment, because those people appreciated it so much until they loved him, and they give their all. He loved them back likewise. By what, never looked down, wasn't a noisy man, quiet, uh, and would just. We'd kill four or five hogs and have people come help us clean the hog. He'd be passing, not passing out. They could take what they wanted and we mm -hmm. shared. Mm -hmm. Now that sharing came out of that, to me, as I look back on it and as a kid growing, it came out of that slave type community where we had to depend on one another. Mm -hmm. And we knew that was the way we had to make it and it carried right on over beyond that period. And it went right on into what, the way my, my grandfather treated Everyone, mm -hmm. and my dad was raised with it, and that's part of life. And you know what? We do the same thing. Yeah. You know, um, I can, I just did something that, you know, was pretty crazy about a young, I'm involved in the scouts, helping kids and all this, and I'm not bragging anything. And kids, dad died, and his mother died, he was small, lived in the community, raised up there, and his dad was an older guy, and the dad died, and left him a little house, an acre of land. And the kid didn't know he, he's 19 years old, he had to pay tax. And what? Tax collector came out and took the property. The property is adjoining my property that I own. They said, Do you want to buy it? And I looked at him and I said to myself, No, I don't want to buy it. Yeah. I go to the tax collector. I said, How much does this cost? What does this guy to pay for it, you know, that bought it at the tax sale? And he told me, My relationship, our relationship is so good with the citizens in, in this area. He told me everything. He said, Tell you what, Vernon. He said, go, Call him. Tell him you talk to me. And the pay, property is valued, a little house on it for fifteen thousand dollars. Well, I ain't got no fifteen thousand right. dollars, but I got the guy down here for nine hundred fifty dollars. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. So what did I do? <clears throat> and, 
<coughs> Pardon me. My sinus has been forever. So I got in con after I got in contact with the guy, and then the, the, this investor said, well, I financed it. I said, no, we'll take care of that. And I sent him a check for 950 bucks. Now, I'm not wealthy. Yeah. $950 is a lot of money to me. <laughs> but in the meantime, I said, this kid was raised up in an environment where people loved him. He had no parental guidance. Yeah. No, not none. It was not good enough for him to survive on his own. And so what? I got all the paperwork fixed up, made him a payment plan. And he's going to pay me back in a year. And, and I show him how to pay your taxes, how to get the homestead exemption. Train like I train my kids. Yeah. And when I finished with him the other day and got him all set up, and he works for my brother, Dennis, that you saw there, mm -hmm. doing the sugar cane thing. Yeah. Cut my mom's yard, okay? Yeah. Hey, we don't throw, we don't throw you away. Right. And, and he's going to do all right. And he left the house, you know, and my wife had some chicken we ate, and he went out there with tears in his eyes. I bet he did. I yeah. mean, you know, it's but, like you know, he lost just, his family hey, and, and he has family I didn't go out in the community. I'll tell you, I, that, that's not for publication. Right. I understand. No, that's what we do. Yeah. Sure. You know, in Claiborne County, there was a man that had land. and Don't let you have to keep me on track Yeah, now. no, no, you're good. And, uh, you know, he, he, he wanted people to have houses. And so, you know, he sold people land at a price they couldn't have bought it anywhere else. Uh -huh. they, they call it Jones Village out there now after him, you know. Is that right? That's right. You know. Where's that at? It's in Claiborne County. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah my doctor's from over there. Yeah. Yeah, he passed away. Yeah. Um, so when you graduated from high school, yes. what did you do next? Uh, I enrolled at Tougaloo. Yeah. Tougaloo's expensive. Okay, but my cousin was going there and his mother was a teacher. Yeah. He could afford it. But I went anyway. <laughs> and uh, went to Tougaloo. And during the very first semester, I became seriously ill with pneumonia mm -hmm. for testing time. And I was unable to take my test. My dad had to come get me. And by the time I recovered, we'd already gone into, you know, another semester. So I just stayed at home. I'm 18 years old at that time, going on 19. I'm a part of the workforce. So I went to work and worked for the remainder part of the year, and then the next school year I went to Alcorn. Yeah. And when I got out to Alcorn, then the second wife, she took seriously ill, and then I had to come home and help in the business because things were not going good after World War II, the general recession, mm -hmm. during the early 50s. And I came home to help my dad, and we buried her. And then I went back to Alcorn again, and by that time I lost my deferment, and that's when the draft came and got me. <laughs> <laughs> so that ended my education, but I had, I, I had a full year, okay. A full year? Yeah, I had oh. thirty-eight credits. Oh, that's that's about it, isn't it? Let's see. Uh, I mean, thirty-eight. That's about three semesters. Wait, let's see, thirty-eight credits, thirteen classes. That's uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, did you like? Well, tell me what Alcorn was like. Alcorn, I went there under the a work program. And uh, a lot of country kids, a lot of kids from the country. And then there were some kids there were from upper class black families too, you know, that mm -hmm. weren't dressed every day. And then there was us kids, you know, looked like we came out of the country. Yeah. <laughs> so there was, there was some adapting to do to that environment, okay? Yeah. And some of them, you know, came out of some schools. Well, they came out of families where they were probably advanced in their education, educational abilities and all. But all in all, it was a big, big thing back in the woods, and and there were very few distractions, <laughs> very few. <laughs> Counting crickets. <laughs> Counting crickets. That's exactly right. And and, uh, and and it was all about work, study, and sports. Mm -hmm. And I was not, you know, qualified to be on any of the teams. Just go to some of them, and that was the extent of it. Very little time for girls. No, hardly none. <laughs> no. Not only that they had a mistress that named Miss Tanner, she'd kill you. So. Yeah, they, they had some strict rules, didn't they? It's very strict rules. Yeah. You walked a girl to the dorm holding her hand, which that was, didn't happen very often anyway. And when you got to the dorm, that ended that. Yeah. No kissing, no hugging, no that. You better get from here. <laughs> and a curfew, too, probably, for the uh, girls. Oh, definitely get curfew. Sure. Was it for you, too, or was it just for the girls? Oh, it says for the girls, I would imagine. Yeah. Well, I know they, they were, I don't know what they had. We didn't, we didn't interact that much except in the classroom. Yeah. 
Uh, was there a big difference between two glue and Alcorn? Uh, yeah. More affluent kids. Definitely more affluent. You could see it. You know, it's, it was, it was obvious. Yeah, I was more comfortable at Alcorn, sure. Um, because I had more guys from rural communities farming, they had a lot more in common, and being in a work program. And Alcorn was an agricultural school. And it was an agricultural school, and I was majoring in agriculture, that was my goal. So that probably influenced. And that, right, it, it did influence. You know, most of my friends worked in a dairy because at that time we had our own dairy, our own cattle, you know, and, and, and all. Fortunately, I had a job inside, you know, mopping <laughs> floors, and this was good. I liked it. <laughs> um, you, when we were talking before we started taping, you mentioned about Tuglu having uh, white faculty. Yes, it did. What was that like for you? Did you think about it? It, I was not overwhelmed by it mm -hmm. because coming out of a community where there were a lot of light-skinned people, mm -hmm. there were there was not this contrast of dark white. Mm -hmm. Because I came out of a family in a community where there were just a lot of light-skinned folks, you know. Mm -hmm. And the whites in, in, in our neighborhood, you know, they interacted also. So, no. But it did surprise me to have white instructors mm -hmm. with all the black students. Mm -hmm. And that may have been a handful of white students there at that time, if I remember correctly. It's kind of hard true. to tell. Yeah. And the president was President Warren. And I think he was handicapped. I think he was. Really? Right? I don't really know much about Tuglu right. at that time. And a couple of my teachers were, one of them I know um, was white. Yeah. Were they from other parts of the country or were they local? I, I don't know. You don't know? No, ma'am. I don't know. Um, I had meant to ask you before, um, was your father registered to vote um, when you were younger? No. Was he ever able to register? No. I know some people were registered and then they took them off the rolls and then they had to try to re-register. No. no. My dad was very conscious of the fact that he was being denied the same opportunity as whites. And he didn't hide that from us. He didn't, he, he depended on them for survival and he never did talk mean about them, but he let us know that there was a difference in, in, in survival. And he would tell us boys, he said, you got to be twice as good to stay out of trouble. You got to work twice as hard to get ahead. It's not even. And he let you know that up front, it is not even. And that helped a lot when I went in the Air Force because I felt a little inferior because I figured these, the white kids went out of these superior schools. But after a while, I found out, well, yeah, they may have came out of a superior institution, but some of them were no smarter than me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> at least I didn't think they were anyway. So, uh, I lost my thought. Well, I had asked you about your dad trying to vote. Oh, yeah. So, in, in growing up in that environment, my dad paid very close attention to what was going on around him, like my grandfather. We had newspaper every day. We didn't have electricity in the, in, in the house up until I was probably in the eighth grade. And we studied by light. And my dad bought a small radio, RCA, one of them old-fashioned kind. And so he could listen to the news and other programs. And he would drive the school bus up to the window of the house <clears throat> and drew the power from the truck battery to run the radio. And that's how you'd listen and to the radio? And there were three things that he listened to religiously. One of them in the evenings, the 6 o'clock news, and, and with uh, John Cameron Swayze, because he'd make us sit down and be quiet and hear the news. If you want to change that, so just let me know. Okay. And everybody, the news is on. He didn't have to tell you. News on, you be quiet and you listen. You didn't leave the room. He listened to Lum and Abner. They came on every day. If you ever heard of Lum and Abner. Mm -hmm. Okay, that was a comedy show of hillbillies. <laughs> <coughs> they came on every day on the Lum and Abner and the jot them down store in the country. Yeah. <coughs> <coughs> and 
in uh, Amos and Andy at 6 o'clock in the evening. And on a Saturday night, he would listen to the Grand Ole Opry. So that was the big entertainment? That big entertainment. So, so you got news right. but, and a couple of shows. But as a result of paying attention and keeping up with the news, we all became news listeners. Mm -hmm. Okay? He influenced you. Influence. And we found out that's where you get your information from. My dad had another saying, once we got big enough to understand what he's talking about, he said, pay attention to what's going on around you and you you have a chance to get away without being a victim of your circumstances. In other words, don't be a victim of your environment because you're not paying attention. Mm -hmm. And he, he had a parable he used. Don't be like a hog eating acorns under a big oak tree. You're eating acorns, but you never look up to see where they're coming from. Mm -hmm. And one day when the acorns run out and you're hungry, you're left to starve to death. So beware of what's going on around you. And that's just the way we all grew up. All of us are very political oriented, okay? Very much so. So we came up in a political environment. So when in, in the mid-1940s, my dad had heard about the NAACP had started up, okay? And he and eight other um, black men established the Forest County branch of the NAACP. It was nine of them that started it. And they held secret meetings. And they, had, they went to the meetings at night. There are nine men, black men, here in the Hattiesburg area that founded the Forest County branch of the NAACP. And it was around 1945, the mid-1940s, okay? And at that time, they had the meetings at night. And my dad would always let us know, let me know, I'm going to an NAACP meeting because it was an underground type organization during that time. And he continued to go to these meetings very religiously. And then when he go to the meeting, uh, he would come home and we'd be working the next day and he'd tell us, tell me and my older brother what was going on as we did our work. All right. And as a result of him being a part of that organization, and he let it and let us know by just a conversation that there were uh, it was it had something to do with politics, okay, it had something to do with voting, okay. So in about 1940. I think I was around 16, 17 years old, maybe. My dad started taking me with him even before then when he did business. I'd go with him when he paid the property tax. And at the same time you paid the property tax to the sheriff, the sheriff was a tax collector in Forest County, he would also pay his poll tax. And when he leave the sheriff's office, he'd go on down the hall to the voter registration office and pay his poll tax. Well, on this one occasion, uh, he went to pay the poll tax. It may have been the first, I don't know what happened prior to then. He went there and he pulled out his receipt, he had his hand, and there was this white man behind the counter, and he walked up and he asked my he knew who my dad was without a doubt, you know, being a country town. Yeah, what do you want? Dad said, I paid my poll tax, I want to register. And he looked at him, and just kind of like stared at him, well, you know, why are you here? I remember that because I'm old enough now to know how you treat my dad. And he gave my dad a, a card, like a four by eight card, uh, six by eight, and it had some writing on it. He said, read that and tell me what it said. And then he went on back and sat down. And my dad read the information on the card, and finally he says, uh, Sir, I'm finished. And the guy came up and looked at him and looked at him. He said, all right, tell me what you read. My dad told him. He said, that's not what he said. And that was the end of it. Now, here's a man, my father, who had, 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 had helped me with my lesson. He was in business. He was running a business. And he couldn't interpret what was on the card. And I was old enough to know that's not true. That aggravated me some. Because what you did, you just denied a man that I care a lot about. Hey, 
uh, and you just told them you don't know what you're talking about. That didn't hit me very well. Now, I didn't get mad about it, but I saw that as strange because I'd never seen this up front that close, okay? I'm sure it's happened other places. And from that time on, uh, he may have continued. I didn't go with him anymore, but I don't know what he did or did not. And the next time I heard anything about him becoming involved was when he became president of the local NAACP during the mid-50s. And as a result of the Supreme Court ruling on the school segregation problem, problem was it Brown versus Board of Education in Kansas, something like that, I think that's right. Uh, Mississippi then tightened up. Hey, it really tightened up. Hey, we're not going to have no school integration here. Well, my dad's already involved in AACP by then. And uh, he's out of the closet. The organization is out of the closet. It's well known. And then that's when he became targeted, you know, by the, by, by the hostile forces out there. After that first incident that you saw, or the, the one that you witnessed, did uh -huh. he, when you're riding home that day, did he say anything to you? Did no, he, he did talk not. to you about what happened? No, he did not. No. I think during that time, I can only think that that was such a routine practice of being denied. Um, you know, maybe not to him so much, he saw it going with other blacks. Mm -hmm. He just suck it up and move on. Yeah. Um, and you said when he was president in the mid-1950s, mm -hmm. you know, people knew who he was. Oh, yeah, without was, a doubt. Um, and, and you said that's when the harassment yeah. started? Yeah, that's when the harassment started then, okay? Do what? Can you, <coughs> you probably weren't <coughs> I wasn't here, but he told he you talked about, about it. Yeah, he talked about can it. Can you tell us what, what he said to you or what you know about it? Yeah, during that time, you know, um, the, uh, the racial climate, was changing, you know, the tension was rising. And this, this friendly atmosphere that we once had there was disappearing. Now here's how I experienced it. Uh, I went in the Air Force 1951. I came home around 1954, 55 at that time after I had re-enlisted and chose the Air Force as a career and I was a staff sergeant. Did well during my first enlistment. And I stopped at the local white grocery store that had been in the community before my dad built his because we had a relationship with, the, with that family because that's where we did our trading. And I stopped there to get some gas and I went in with a real friendly atmosphere and uh, the, the wife of the store owner, she was there and I spoke to her and they had one son and he was several years younger than me but I saw him grow up so I asked her, I says, well, where's your son? I called him by his name and said, you mean Mr. So-and-so? Well, here I am now 25 years old, 26, and she want me to call her son, who's probably still a teenager, Mr. Never saw that before. And I stopped at another grocery store in the community on down, coming toward Hattiesburg, where we would stop occasionally and I went in there just to buy something because I felt comfortable being at home. And the grocery store owner there, he said, well, oh, you're in there, you're up north now. And I says, yes, I am. I was stationed in Nebraska, Omaha, and off at Air Force Base. And he says, well, what's it like being up there? Okay. <laughs> Are they different? <laughs> okay. So he was quizzing me on my... Uh, being outside of that in Mississippi environment, have you been and ruined? how and how had it affected me being in a more integrated area? And I picked up on that immediately. He was wanting to know if you'd been ruined. <laughs> what not? I'd been been ruined. That's exactly <laughs> right. So that's how I knew then that the things had changed, and that my dad then was getting into a situation. But I didn't really focus on it because there had not been any open violence. It was just a rise in the, in, in the recognition that things are about to happen in Mississippi now that the masters don't want to happen. Mm -hmm. And now we, you, you're not going to be treated quite as kindly 
and as friendly as it was because now you're starting to threaten our way of life. Mm -hmm. And I had to look back on it. I didn't recognize it at that time. So what I did then was I didn't, I didn't go into these places. I just kind of stayed away from them. Yeah. Uh. Did your father talk to you about the changing atmosphere or did you just know it from your own experience? When I would visit home, he didn't have to say it. Mm -hmm. It was obvious. Yeah. And what I mean by obvious, um, he would, for example, I came home with my family at that time because wife and a couple of kids and we stayed there with them. And he says, hey, be careful where you go and you hear at nighttime, we don't walk and get in front of windows. Uh, and also we've seen, seen some harassment here. There's a gun in that room where you're going to be. If you hear anything, hey, be aware of it, okay? Well, being military, that was no big deal, you know, come out of family, we had guns. Hey, that's okay, I'm comfortable with that environment. So I saw the difference happening then, okay? It's a real change to have to take all those precautions. They have to take all those precautions, that is exactly right. Sure. Can you tell me about your own military experience? What, what happened when you got drafted? What I happened when I got drafted was, uh, it was during the height of the Korean War, and there was troops everywhere. And what I mean by everywhere, you know, when you get into that military environment, and I left home uh, on a bus, went to Jackson along with some other recruits, went to the to the recruiting stand, regiment at the reporting place, and it was on a tri-state bus, a Greyhound, one or the other, and there were whites and black guys on there. And maybe some other passengers, don't remember exactly. But anyway, we got there and checked in. The day was far along. They gave us some food and took us to a motel. Well, there was no motel for whites. We went out on Ferris Street. And there was a black hotel down there, okay? Well, I'd been on Ferris Street, so yeah, I'm all right with it. And the white ones, they went way over, they went. And the next morning, got up, you know, and they picked us up in the bus and carried us to the induction center. And that's when the processing took place, you know, along stripping down, doing your physicals and all, and getting ready to ship us out. From there, the next day we left, and we ended up went to San Antonio, Texas, to Lackland Air Force Base, which is a major Air Force training base. And now, I mean, there were troops all over the place, and we were sleeping in tents because the permanent structures were all full. And I um, stayed there just, no oh, about three weeks. And to keep us busy, the guys busy. Um, once we went, got up, dressed, do your military thing, and they would go out and pick up big rocks, put them in a pile. And then the next week would come along and we'd pick up the smaller ones and put them in piles. Okay, <laughs> let's keep it busy. You think I'm kidding, that's a fact. <laughs> all right, and then, then during the night, they'd spread them all out again or whatever, all right? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, we, we, you went through all that stuff, you know, and I'm, I'm a man 22 years old, been working on the farm. Yeah, I'm out here picking up rocks. You know, <laughs> uh, and then we went on, uh, shipped us out to Shepherd Air Force Base in Wichita Falls, Texas. And that's where I did my basic training. And from basic training, uh, I was assigned to Francis C. Warren Air Base in Cheyenne, Wyoming, for my tech training. And uh, that was a teletype training uh, school there along with other training uh, facilities too for in the communications field and there was a motor transportation big letting kids how to drive trucks and stuff. Let me ask you so how how did you feel about being drafted? I tried to try my best to stay out of it. My dad tried to get me deferred yeah. and I, I didn't want to go. Yeah. No I did not want to go all because I just I'm comfortable where I am. Yeah. Yeah. What about um were you drafted specifically into the Air Force, or did no, you no, have no. any say? Oh, that's the piece I missed. No, let me tell you how that happened. All right. Uh, one, maybe a month, a little over, uh, prior to going in the Air Force, I received a letter from the they had a name, local board. Mm -hmm, the draft board. Draft board. Directing that I report 
for induction on the 15th of September, 1951. And I looked at it and I says, okay, well, I'm getting get ready to get out of here. So I leaving the house with my dad and I told him, say, hey, this is what this is about. So I start preparing to go off, uh, off to the army because that's where the guys were going. Right. Uh, my uncle, my dad's baby sister's husband, was in the 92nd Infantry um, in Italy, a ground foot soldier, fought. And I told him, he said, no, no, you don't want to do that. Uh-uh. Then I had a couple of other black guys in the community that was in combat. He said, you don't want to do that. He says, hey, go to the Navy or the Air Force. Don't get caught up in this Army thing. And after they told me that, I said, okay. So I procrastinated up until the 10th <laughs> of September. You, you didn't give yourself much. No. <laughs> and I said, look, I got to do because make up my mind. So I went to the Air Force recruiter here in Hasbury. It's in the basement of the old post office downtown. Yeah. And I walked in, and there was an Air Force recruiter, Armor recruiter, Navy recruiter. And I'm not sure whether they had a Marine or not. And I saw the Air Force, and I went in that door. And that sergeant he said to me, can I help you? And I told him, I said, I'd like to volunteer for the Air Force. So he gave me some papers to fill out, you know, and I took some tests or whatever. And uh, he said, well, when you want to leave? I said, can I leave today? <laughs> <laughs> he said, no, the bus is already gone. He said, what about in the morning? Be down here at 7 o'clock. I said, okay, I'll be here. Yeah. So at 7 o'clock, I reported to the post office, and they were there, and they carried us down to the bus station, which is there on Walnut Street, <laughs> you know, caught a bus yeah. out to Jackson. And so after I uh, got situated at Shepard Air Force Base in basic training, which is in Wichita Falls, Texas, and that was, in, by the way, in the early part of September of 1951, um, I was in my uh, unit, in my squad, drilling with them out on the parade field, going through my training. And in that group, it must have been about 30 guys, you know, in these squads. My name came out over the PA system. Private Vernon Damer Jr. report to the orderly room. I'm 22 years old. I'm in there with a bunch of guys, 18, 19, maybe 20. I'm kind of like the old dude, okay? And there were a few left over in World War II, you know, that was coming back again, and but not very many. I don't know if it was one in my outfit. But anyway, I said, dang, what have I done now? Because I'm in this military environment now. Your name come out, and you don't remember anything that you did. What have I done? Right. And so the squad leader called, scary. called to a halt, dismissed me from the group, told me to report to the orderly room. I went to the orderly room, reported to the first sergeant. He, these two gentlemen don't want to talk with you. They were in civilian clothes. And they asked me, your name? I told them, Vernon F. Damon Jr. Let me see your dog tags. Dog tags around my neck, pulled my dog tags out, and they checked them. Yeah, that's who you are. He said, you know, you're a draft dodger. No, sir. I didn't know that. Well, didn't you get your notice from the local board? Lying through my teeth. No, sir. <laughs> I didn't sign for it. <laughs> Lied, stood in flat footed, and he says, Well, will you they sent you one. I said, No, sir, I never got it. He said, Well, okay. You're already in now. I guess that's all right. Well, I guess it is all right. You're gonna take me out and put me in the army? I wasn't thinking that for him, I'm thinking that now. And when we did that, boy, the perspiration dried up. And I got a hold of my nerves. And the first sergeant said, all right, get back to your unit. I went back to my unit. Did you, did you know that that might happen? Or did you just? No, I didn't know that was going to happen. No, and these guys flashed their badges on me. Yeah. So they were some, from some kind of investigative unit. I don't know whether it was the FBI or the local Army investigators. You know, at Air Force, they have, have their own investigators. Yeah. But no, they were federal. I know that, though. They had to yeah. be federal. A little nerve-wracking. Without you, a doubt. And, and you came up with that. <laughs> oh, hey, 
on your feet. Oh my! Well, if you know, being 22 years old, you learn how to laugh, <laughs> and you learn how to laugh quick, especially when you get in the band. Sounds like it came in handy. Yes, it did. That's a good skill, I guess. Yeah, very good. <laughs> it worked. Uh, when you went into the military, yeah, how did you end up? Uh, you said you went to the communication school for teletype training. Yeah, how did that come about? That's another phase that's very interesting. Uh, I was assigned to Francis C. Warren Air Base in Cheyenne, Wyoming, and to become a teletype operator. Being raised on a farm, where we had an old cash register my dad found somewhere, and it was manual. And now you're taking this farm boy who's been used to driving trucks, hauling logs, running tractor, and all this. Yes, I had mechanical ability, operation type, operating type abilities, but not for no typewriter, no teletype, yeah. or no typewriter. And they, I, they assigned me that school, and I started off, and after that for a while, I was in this typing class, J-U-J -J space, F-G-F -F space, and I'm telling myself, I don't want to be in no, be no teletype operator. This doesn't fit me in my prior experience. And across this great big open field, Wyoming's big and everything is open, <laughs> was a bunch of guys in training, learning how to drive a, a truck with a trailer. Well, I knew how to do that. I got back a truckload of lumber down an alley. And I'm sitting there, you know, uh, in front of a typewriter, and I can go over to that school, and I can go right through that and be a truck driver. And I don't have to deal with this typewriter. Well, being the older guy in the community, I mean, in, the, in, in my squadron, I had a relationship somehow or another with the first sergeant. You know, been around a little bit. And I started to be his runner. He asked me, he said, Damer, I need guys that carry messages from one outfit to another to the headquarters. Do you want to do that? That's during my off time when I got off in the evening, okay? Well, I'm doing this remedial training, me and two other guys trying to catch up in the typing. And then I would do that, you know, on my off time, thinking I may get a little something out of that. So during, the, during that time I was working with the first sergeant, things got real comfortable with me. I said, Sarge, I said, can I go in and talk to the captain? I want to go to the old head to that, that uh, automotive training place, uh, to that truck driving school. And he said, man, look, they don't need you doing that. You're in teletype. Finally, which one day he said, okay, he made an appointment for me to see the captain. And I got all dressed up and went in and reported to the captain and gave him my experience, you know, driving truck, raised on a farm. And he's sitting there, you know, with this nice little smile on his face. And I thought I was getting over on him. <laughs> and when I finished, he says, you know what, you got a lot of good experience. And they can use you over there. He said, but Private Dema, he says, uh, the Air Force needs come first. And I want you to go back down to that teletype school and be the test, best teletype operator <laughs> in the outfit. <laughs> he busted my bull bubble right in front of his desk. And when I went by the first sergeant, he said, I told you so. <laughs> I went on back to the bar barracks and I got with it. You get resigned yourself? Yes, I did. I learned how to type, graduated, and believe it or not, that was the best decision that was made for me by somebody else. Yeah. That being a teletype operator moved me into the communications vein all the way to computers when I retired as a senior master sergeant. Mm. There ain't no way I would have been a senior master sergeant driving a truck. And, and, I, and I got promoted on my first enlistment because I was used to what? Studying, I was used to commitment, so I didn't have no problem with becoming a good teletape operator. And it worked, it worked out real well. Then, I, you know, I married two one month before I went in the Air Force, and um, by the time I finished my first enlistment at Tyndall Air Force Base in Florida, where I was stationed, I was already a staff sergeant. I could take my family with me any place I went, and then assignment came up going to Europe, but prior to my first assignment, let me back up a moment. Coming out of teletype school, my first assignment then was to a radar station in Omaha, Nebraska. Not to the air, but it's a radar station. From there to Nome, Alaska, at a radar site, overlooking the Siberian Straits, watching the Russians take off and land every day. <laughs> 
they fly you out and they leave you there for a year. Wow. Isolated. I'm married one month before I leave. My wife is pregnant with a baby, you know. I'm wanting to be home and I'm sitting here now in this isolated place waiting for a year to pass. That must have been a... To me, it was domesticated purism or whatever. <laughs> but, but it was all work, nothing else to do. You work and slept. And I cleaned up and did extra work in the officer's quarters, you know, make extra money to send to my wife and all. Yeah. So when I came, when I was assigned from there, I had preference on the base because of this. Because of where you had been? Where I had been. And I picked Panama City, Florida, which was close to home. And then, and your wife was able to be and with you And my wife there? came down there with me, but I only had two strikes. She came down, but they had quarters on base for low rank and airmen. And by that time, uh, I had two kids, boy and a girl. They were little types. And I went there with two stripes, and I stayed there and made two more while I was there. Thing worked out well, and I re-enlisted, and that started my Air Force career. So at re-enlistment time, I talked to my wife. I says, look, now prior to talking with my wife, this warrant officer from Kentucky, white fellow, World War II vet, was my boss. He was a communications officer over the whole thing. And... I had left the comm center, being a teletype operator, and I was his clerk. I learned how to type on a typewriter then, okay? <laughs> and that's why I got my rank working for him. <laughs> he jacked me up, fixed me up, but I had to work, though. Then I became a Western Union accountant clerk where doing other tasks. And he said, asked me one day, he said, Sergeant Damon, he said, you're coming up for re-enlistment, because I talk about it. He said, what you going to do? I said, well, I'm going back to Mississippi to my dad. And, you know, he saw me on, he said, he said, you're crazy. He said, you only got 16 years to go. You're already a staff sergeant. <laughs> so let me ask you, I don't know if, know if I know enough about the military. So was your, was your draft two years or four years? It was a four-year tour. It was a four-year well, tour. Air Force been a four-year tour. So, okay, so once you moved towards the Air Force, you had to commit had, to a I, longer I, I, tour. I, I, two, two more years. All right, so you, had, so, you had, so you had invested four years. I invested four years. But that gave me a chance to make enough rank to where I could make a decision whether I want to become a career and, in hindsight. And so that was enough for you to envision a career with the, the Air Force. I could envision this year. And then when I told, told my boss, one of officer, because his office is like there, and I'm in here at a typewriter answering phones and doing this other work, he said, you're crazy. And he and the top sergeant in the outfit there who was in the office with him come and said, hey, you don't want to do that. Hey. Started explaining the Air Force benefits and the things going on, which I hadn't really zeroed in on. And so after I talked with my wife and thought about it, and I said, yeah, I re-enlist. And I went back and I told him, I said, yeah, Mr. Heath Warren. I said, Mr. Johnson, yes, I re-enlist. He, he made an appointment, and I went out and talked to the commanding officer, squadron leader, major. And he already received notification that I was going to re-enlist. And I walked in, he shook me, he said, hey, Mr. Johnson, say you're going to re-enlist. I said, yes, sir, I'm going to do He said, congratulations. Then they sent me up for re-enlistment, okay? And they were giving me a bonus. For re-enlisting? Yeah. And if you re-enlist for four years, you get a certain amount. If you re-enlist for six years, you get more money. Well, since I'm going, I went for six years. And when I went to the finance office, they paid us in cash. I had a stack of $20 bills that high. <laughs> That's most money I've ever seen in my life. And I said, oh, man. So you felt like you made a good oh, decision. I went home and told my wife I was rich. Because she lived there on base, you know. And uh, had bought me a little Ford car. Yeah. And everything was going well. And that started my Air Force career. And uh, the house was firebombed in 1966. In 1964, my family and I had returned from Germany. And we visited with my dad and my mom there in the family home. And my wife is from here also. So between the two families. And I saw at that time that the the racial tension was real high, and my dad was quite conscious then of his safety. Uh, but being home and enjoying being home, I didn't really focus on it that much. Then I was assigned to March Air Base in California, and I moved my family there with me, got the kids involved in school, and at that time, I was uh, Master Sergeant. And I, I became 
shift leader in a big communications uh, organization. And I didn't hear anything more from my dad because we didn't communicate that much because he had his thing going, I had mine going, my Air Force career and kids in school and all. And on the uh, morning, Monday morning, January 10th, 1966, I received a telephone call from one of my dad's sisters who lived in uh, Compton, there in South Central LA, Compton, California. And I was informed of what had happened. The house had been firebombed, and it was like two or three o'clock in the morning. It woke me up out of a deep sleep. I was living in my own house downtown, I bought a house downtown with my family. And that, that was really a shock. I wasn't too surprised because what I had seen, but at that time it was a shock. So I woke my wife up and told her what, what had happened. And I proceeded then to get ready uh, to go to work, put my uniform on. And so while sitting, after I got ready to go, I had time to think. Couldn't call anybody because what? The house had been burned, destroyed, and there was no telephone communication. So I'm here now just waiting on my, to find out what my next move is going to be. So in my thoughts, I said, you know what? I know the, the how blacks are treated uh, in the justice system, because I'm a grown man now, I'm 35 years old, in Mississippi. And something told me, go to the FBI office in Riverside and tell them about what has happened and express my desire, what I would like to see happen in my dad's case. I reported downtown Riverside, California, Federal Building. I was standing outside the FBI office when they came to work. Just two or three gentlemen came in and we greeted one another, went in the office and said, can I help you? And I told them about it. And they said, yeah, we already know about it. Because they were keeping up with these fire bombings apparently on, the, on that system. And long story short, I says, I have one request. I do not want any law enforcement officers, people on my dad's case, none from Mississippi, outside of Mississippi, Franklin. I'm well aware of the FBI. You know, I have top secret DSI clearance. I'm well aware of what's going on now. And that one FBI officer looked at me and he says, hold on a minute. Are you telling me that you in doubt the integrity of the FBI? I never will forget it, like it recorded on my brain. And I told him, I didn't say that. I tell you what my desire was. And from that time on, I found out later that I was being trailed. I was an observation. Once, one of the reasons being is uh, of my security clearance and my position, because I was in charge of base telecommunications center, had 50 people working, handling all kind of intelligence stuff. Very super sensitive thing. And the commanding officer, when I left going home, who was a colonel, called me in his office and told me, do not compromise my position, you know. How, how did they think you might do that? What, what were of they? what I knew. I had access to. So they think, but what did they think you would do with it? Well, you know, we've had, we, we've had people, you know, deserting from, and going on and doing crazy stuff. Just won't let me know that my commitment was to the Air Force. Well, my commitment is also to my family. I'm not going to kill a career of 15 years going home, and, you know, and, and do some crazy stuff. No, but that was okay. And I don't recall him ever telling me, that, you know, he regret what happened to my dad because I wasn't focused on that. But when I went by the first sergeant, you know, who was a good friend of mine, uh, you know, big outfit, 900 people, he looked, he just kind of shook his head like, dang. In the meantime, I, I went on there and started preparing to come home. And I arrived home, that was on, I left, I left Los Angeles, Los Angeles Airport at midnight on that Monday night after I got reservations on. I arrived in New Orleans that next morning and got a flight coming out of New Orleans to home. And during my trip home, I saw this one guy on the plane. I didn't, didn't notice it at the time, but the same guy that I saw on the plane that boarded the plane at midnight in LA, and we got to New Orleans, had to change planes a couple of times because we were having difficulty, and finally I caught a bus 
and came on the bus when I got to the site, I saw the same guy again, but I never connected the dots. They already had somebody. I already had somebody on me. And that, and that person stayed on me for a long time because when I got back to my job after being home for two weeks, and there, one of the guys in my department where all of the messages on the base, all kind of clearances, going through my facility that I'm in charge of, they never, never did identify me as being the guy who sees everything that go on. The message come, come across telling them about my activity. So my, my analysis guy showed it to me. <laughs> so then, you know, I says, hey, these people don't know I'm a Negro or whatever, you know. <laughs> and so I said, well, they've been keeping up with me. But in the meantime, coming home to bury my dad and what happened, this is the most essential part. My dad, the father of eight children, seven boys and a girl, seven of his sons, including me, uh, served a total of 78 years on active duty during the Korean and Vietnam era and beyond. We were serving our nation, protecting the very country that neglected to protect my family from the terrorist forces here. My dad and mom slept in shifts for years, which my mom probably told you about. For years, while we were throughout the world, what? protecting the nation, and my country couldn't protect me. Coming home to that devastated site that morning when I arrived, and I looked at the burned out facilities, which you, I think you've probably seen pictures of, and I went to the morgue and looked at my dad. That was probably the worst days of my life. I mean, that was horrible. But I... Uh, I said, hey, you're the oldest kid. You got a responsibility. You've been around. You, 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 your mom, your sister, been burned. Your dad's dead. My family's homeless. Law enforcement people everywhere. Reporters everywhere. Uh, curiosity seekers everywhere at the burned out site. Some grieving. Some whatever. But I got to deal with this issue and then the burden is on my shoulder. Okay? And, and having that responsibility as I grew up in the Air Force prepared me for uh, a lot of tough stuff. But I was not prepared to deal with this. But I said, it's over now. You got to do what. So I just blocked it out. And I started dealing with the objective. I mean, immediately. Dad ain't dead. You know, as far as I'm concerned, yeah, he's dead. But I don't let this get in the way of what I have to do. Consequently, I got good family, and I had some help, but the decision was on around me, being the oldest son, because that's just where we were raised. And in the meantime, I'd contact my other brothers, and they was coming in, and, and the family and getting prepared for the funeral and all this other stuff. Now that was a very tough time. I tell you, tough. There's never been another time in my life, and it wasn't uh, my my dad's death. Death comes, but the way he died. And, and, and the contribution he'd made society and the contributions he saw, all of us retired from the military with honorable discharge and with accolades, you know, file full of things that we did that we learned at home to do right. And we're good soldiers, no, no black mark nowhere, and we deal with this. So, and I looked at it, I said, well, my praise for, for defending my country was to what? Put up with it, what happened to it. That, that, that's... That's what my country thought of me, because this did not have to happen. The oath that my brothers and I took, hey, we lived up to it. Wherever they were going to send us, that's where we were going to go, and we were going to do what we had to do. That's the way we... But the oath that those people who took to protect my family, they did not do it. And I fought my country for not, what, making them do that. Now, I still love my country, but I still say, hey, my country could have done a better than that. If I can do this for my country, why come my country couldn't do this for my family? And it took me a while to get over that. But I never thought about being vindictive. That ain't me. But you, these things go through because what? You have been denied the opportunity that you gave all your for to try to have. And that, 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 that was tough. When, um, when your father was killed, 
were all of your brothers who'd served in the military, had they already, uh, were they already in the military, or did some of them join after? No, no, no. All of us had gone. And, and drafted, right? Y yes. Well, I said join, but. But they were in the military. I don't know how they, you know, how all of them got there. Being the oldest, I was the first. When my dad was killed, there was four of us on active duty. I was in California. I mean, my brother next to me, the second one, he was career. He was on Shemi Island off of Alaska. My other brother was in Germany, and I had one in Florida. And my brother Harold, uh, who just returned from Korea and ended his uh, commitment to the service, honorably discharged, he was in the house that night. So the time that mom, dad, mom and dad were sleeping in shifts to avoid what eventually happened, they had five sons serving on active duty in the military. And for us four sons to come, out, come home in uniform and buried my dad because of what? Uh, 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 of these race haters, all because he's the wrong race, he's the wrong color, but he's born in this country. He was a good citizen, well thought of, my family good citizens, and as far as I'm concerned, we wasn't better than nobody, but hey, my family had, and as far as I'm concerned, did a good job in raising us to be good citizens. And we live by that code today. Did anybody at the time recognize that fact about all of you all serving your country? Yeah. Other than the fact when we came home, you know, we'd be in the newspaper, the sergeant came home, that one came home. But, but nobody as far special, the special, no, no. Yeah, the contradiction you're pointing out. Right, nobody pointed out. Can you talk about what your family's done over the years to try to pursue you know, there's probably no justice in this case, but to make sure that some people were held accountable? Yes. Uh, my mom is a lady that I, that, that I have the utmost respect for. And she gets that respect from all of us. You know, uh, she, she's number one in our life. She's the leader of our family. Even though we were grown men, she went through all this, and we never overshadow her. You may notice that. We don't do that. And, and as a result of what happened to our family, she chose not to leave. She chose to stay here because she had those two kids. She was a teacher. And she had brothers living in Washington and other places, you know, that were uh, financially in good shape. One, one, one brother was a dentist. Others worked for the federal government in Washington, had good jobs. And they said, hey, leave the place. Come here. She, said, she thought, she said, I'm not going. And she stayed, built a house on the same spot, hey, and, and, and raised those two kids, Dennis and Betty, that she had by my dad. Okay, my brother and my sister. We don't have no haves. Everybody's brothers and sisters. Sent them to college, college degrees. They are professionals and went on off in their life. And, and she built a home with the assistance and continued her life, became an election commissioner in the same district where my dad was killed for three terms and could have had more terms, and, 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 and the whites put her in, all because of the kind of life that she lived. It wasn't because they felt sorry for her. That was probably a part of it, a little sympathy there, but because of the life that she did and the way that she lived her life after this catastrophic event. And then she had to, what, live through all of these Klansmen's trials she testified over 70 something times, and after the 14 who did this were indicted, and they brought some to justice, and finally uh, they couldn't get Sam Bowles after they tried him four times, because what, the jury had Klansmen in there. She went through a whole, whole lot, and, and as a result, she maintained the family nucleus, the location, and we all came back home around her. And, 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 and built where you see we are today. She held everything intact. And to me, that demonstrates uh, a whole lot about who we are as a family. You know, there ain't no big eyes and little U's. We, we just a family committed to where we were raised and we got a lady here that my dad chose to be his wife down the road that we totally respect to the end. And that we do. It's such a, such a thing to have to go through. And it seems like that, um, that you all have handled it as well as anybody could. 
coming coming out of this situation after we got the conviction of Sam Bowers. Did that help? Yeah, you know, Sam Bowers was, was in 1998. The Medgar's case serviced the opportunity for us to get Sam Bowers back in the courtroom. We won't go through all of that. Can but you just, I mean, we know, but can you say who Sam Bowers is for people yeah, oh, in the yes, future yeah, for who Sam, might... ba Sam Bowers was the leader of the White Knights of the Ku Klux Klan uh, in Jones County in, in Law, Mississippi area. And he had power that was equal to the governor's, what my former Klansman told me, that he was, he, he was highly re regarded and he could go to the governor's office anytime. And he had told former uh, Klansman, other Klansmen in, in his organization, you can kill a kill a black man or a nigger in Mississippi. You don't have to worry about going to jail. Now I got this from a former Klansman. Okay, so Sam Sam Bowers w w w was a man that was beyond reach during that era. And to get him back into the courtroom in 1998, which required a lot of work, cause we our family worked with the with the law enforcement people to get him back to the courtroom. And I was the primary leader on that, with the assistance of the family. Now, but you got to have a spokesperson. My mom and I, and my brother Dennis helped a lot also. And we worked with the news media and all, and created enough attention on it. Created, we created enough attention, you know, till we got the support of the community, because what. We, we'd gone through all these phases and only got five convictions out of the previous trials that was held in, 19, in the 1960s, late 1968, 67, 68. But we never could get Sam. Now we have a chance to get Sam. Uh, for Sam, and Sam was convicted on the 21st of August uh, by jury, verdict, 1998. Somewhere around between two and three o'clock, a day I'll never forget. For the for what he had done, and he was carted off to the jail and there to prison, and he died in November of two thousand and six in prison. What did it mean for you that he? Justice finally, even though it was thirty-two years late, wish it had been better. But it finally came and was very pleased. There were no high fives. There were no celebrations. We was glad to be treated equally in the justice system as others, even though it took a long time to do it. It took 32 years to do this. And the good thing that I see with my family, and I give this to my mom because she stayed here and dealt with it, uh, is that we didn't give up, and the community worked with us and didn't allow us to give up. In other words, we had these memorial services every year on January the 10th, and you know, about that time at the church to keep it alive. And the Hub City Professional Men's Club, which is an all black men's club in Hattiesburg, my brother was a part of that, Alvin, they have a program every year. For 25 years, they kept it alive. And we got good support when it came time for the, the Trials 98. We had good support from all of the law enforcement officers. I never got one bad telephone call. One of my neighbors that I grew up with, a white guy, told me, he says, Vernon, he said, they're still out there. He says, I'm not sure if I was you, I'd be doing this. Well, I, I thanked him, and I appreciated it, and I moved on because I'd seen worse things in life. My dad gave his life, the least I can do, or we can do as a family, is to keep on Pursuit. doing what we had to do until we get justice, at least try to. Okay. Go ahead. This photo is a, of my father, Vernon F. Damer Sr., um, back in his young days. Okay. This photo is a copy of the home site that was destroyed by the 
firebombing uh, on January the 10th, which involved the white knights of the Ku Klux Klan of Laurel, Mississippi, led by Sam Bowers. This is the burned out structure of the family home. Uh, taken about three or four days uh, after the fire bombing, those standing overlooking the site are my brothers who were serving in the military on active duty at other locations, including me. And I'm a part of this photo also. Okay, this is a copy of the grocery store prior to the fire bombing. Uh, the grocery store was adjacent to the house about 100, 150 feet away. This is the burned out site of the grocery store uh, with two of my dead son, my brothers, um, looking at the burned out debris following the fire bombing. This is a, uh, a copy photo is of the family members following the funeral of my father's funeral, which took place uh, the exact date, I'm not sure, but it was the weekend following January 10th, which was on a Saturday. This is a copy of the car which was in the carport, uh, which, was, which was destroyed along with the fire bombing. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture.